Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Darcy Belito de Luna and I am the Continuing Education Manager at the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. As part of our Continuing Education Program for Healthcare Professionals, I am pleased to host this webinar on preparing yourself and your equipment during the COVID-19 pandemic, presented by Dr. Jacques Abramowitz. Today's webinar will discuss how to prepare your practice, protect yourself, and clean your instruments. This program is a non-CME educational activity in collaboration with Samsung. If you have questions for the presenter during this webinar, you may type them into the question box at the bottom of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering questions until he has completed his presentation at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Jacques Abramowitz. Good morning, afternoon, night. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, thank you for AIUM and Samsung to, for allowing me to do this. And as you've heard today, what we're going to talk about is how to prepare yourself and your ultrasound equipment during the pandemic. Now, you may ask, well, the pandemic has been going on for some time now. Why, why are we talking about it again and again? Well, you've all heard about the second wave. The second wave uh, that seems to have started somewhere. Um, in the United States, for instance, there are major increases in cases uh, after there had been some flattening of the curve. So there certainly is a reason to, to continue talking about this. And in fact, here is an article from uh, last week that says the second wave could be worse than the first. Now, it needs to be made clear that the opinions and recommendation here are mine. They're based on extensive reviews of publications, both in print and online. And they need to be adapted. They may need to be adapted to local situation in certain areas of the world or in certain communities or in certain practices. It may not be possible to do exactly what is recommended by the CDC, the WHO, the AUM, or the World Federation. Everything needs to be done, of course, in accordance with local authorities. So how did it all start? Well, as far as we know, it started in Wuhan, where a cluster of pneumonia cases were reported to the WHO office in China at the end of December 2019. On January 30th, that's a month later, the WHO said that's an emergence, there's an, a public health emergency of international concern. And on March 11, 2020, the coronavirus outbreak was declared a pandemic by the WHO. Uh, quite soon after the beginning of that uh, problem, The Lancet published a, uh, an article about the COVID outbreak saying, well, we need to use stethoscope less, but use the ultrasound more. And then very soon after that, the major hospital in Wuhan published a handbook, which is very well written, which is available online um, and explains in great details the way they manage the uh, pandemic. Uh, WOFOM, the World Federation of Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology, that includes, as you can see, Flaus, the uh, Latin American Federation, the Asian Federation, the Australasian Federation, MASU, Mediterranean and African, AIUM, the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine, EFSUM, the European Federation of Ultrasound, and the Asian Federation for Ultrasound, um, very quickly decided to write a, a position statement on how to perform 
a safe ultrasound exam and clean the equipment in the context of COVID-19. This was published recently in Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology and is available online um, uh, at uh, the site of the journal. AIUM has an official, several official statements. One of the official statements uh, was published a few years ago regarding cleaning uh, transducer and equipment between patients, but it was updated a few weeks ago because of the COVID-19, and we will uh, discuss this a little bit later. The European Safety Committee has a lot of information, uh, not a specific statement, but a lot of information and a collection of guidances. Uh, from all these uh, societies, the British Medical Ultrasound Society, the German, European, etc., etc., etc. And on their website, there's a, a list of ultrasound issues in general, long ultrasound, obstetrics and gynecology, how to disinfect your system. And if you want to read them, you have to read 20 websites or something like that, which is why in this uh, webinar, I'm going to try and summarize the best known information. Now, there are specific information or recommendation for OBGYN. I am an OBGYN myself, so there are some recommendation. And I've helped uh, writing this one that uh, the International Society of Ultrasound and OBGYN, ISWAP, has published on the safe performance and equipment cleaning uh, in OBGYN as well as the use of protective equipment uh, for in OBGYN. Of course, the, world, the WHO um, has also documents getting your workplace ready. The CDC has documents. So there's a lot of documents. Now the WHO published this one two weeks ago um, on, on the use of chest imaging, but a part of it was uh, the infection prevention and control, which is part of what we're doing today, including chest imaging for by ultrasound. These are the two annexes on the WHO document, and those who are interested certainly uh, should look into that. Now, why is ultrasound special? Well, there are specific problems to ultrasound. The first one, of course, is physical proximity to the patient. You know that the recommendation is six feet, two meters of social or physical distancing. This is not possible with ultrasound. When you perform an ultrasound, the distance between you and the patient may be as little as 30 or 50 centimeters. The ultrasound rooms typically are rather small. The ventilation may be restricted. Often there are no windows because we want the rooms to be dark. Sometimes the examination may last 10 to 60 minutes, so prolonged time of exposure uh, to your patient. And sometimes, for instance, if you do renal ultrasound, you will ask the patient to inhale, exhale deeply, hold his or her breath that may cause coughing, or even the deep exhale can cause uh, viruses to be uh, sent to uh, the atmosphere. Of course, with ultrasound, sometimes we need to perform invasive or transvaginal transrectal procedures. Ultrasound is used in therapeutic and interventional procedures, which may increase the risk of exposure. Patients may be coughing, sneezing, exhaling heavily, as I said. And of course, the services of the ultrasound machine, especially the keyboard, the touch screen, the trackball, are very frequently touched by uh, the people performing the ultrasound. So this webinar will have a few uh, you know, parts, general precautions, personal protection equipment, PPE, instrument, accessories, rooms, cleaning and disinfection, and with a particular um, emphasis on ultrasound transducers. There are some uncertainties regarding the transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 virus. There's no doubt that close contact seems to be the main route, and that's why it's so important when we perform ultrasound. 
There are two major routes of infection as far as we know. There are large droplets, more than 10 microns, that is called droplet transmission. So these are released during coughing, sneezing, or even, even deep breathing. Now, because they are large, because they're heavy, they tend to fall immediately to surfaces or objects, not no further than one to two meters from the infected person. They evaporate quickly, but not before reaching the surfaces. And if we don't clean, the virus may remain active there wherever it fell for hours or even days. Now, how do you get infected? By breathing in the droplets or by touching the infected fomites, whether the tabletop, the, 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 the screen of the computer, and then touching your eyes, nose, or mouth. The second aspect is airborne small particles. These are less than five microns, so they're much lighter, they're smaller, and they travel much longer distances because they are lighter and they don't fall immediately to the floor. That is aerosol transmission. Also generated during coughing or sneezing, but also generated during interventions. There's a long list of interventions here. That list is not inclusive, but for instance, bronchoscopy, CPR, a gastrostomy, tracheostomy, uh, nebulizer treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are the procedure that if you're involved with ultrasound, these are the one where there's a risk of aerosol transmission. And in fact, the virus may stay airborne for hours and transported long distances, including possibly carried by room airflow. Now, the first aspect that we need to talk about is that ultrasound provided with specific health condition should have limited patient contact. Now, what are the specific health condition? We started by saying, well, people who are older than 65, although the WHO from the beginning said no, 60 or older, and people of any age who have serious underlying medical conditions. As you all know, a lot of younger people are now affected. So that um, uh, number of 60 or 65 may have been very true at the beginning, but maybe less valid as we progress uh, in time. Now, because ultrasound practitioners are in close contact with patients, surgical face masks are essential. Of course, you must put them on before you enter in the patient room or the care area. And when available, you should use N95 respirators because they have a high level of protection. And certainly you, you should use those when you're performing or you're present in a procedure that is aerosol generating for instance, in the intensive care unit, if you're called to perform a long ultrasound or another type of ultrasound. It's important that sonographers, technicians, and certainly physicians who perform ultrasound should have infection control training and be fitted for respirators in case these are needed. Um, if it possible, uh, you need to have the attending, the faculty, and the staff working in teams. So covering alternatively every two weeks, so that in fact, if a team is affected, a second team is available to continue taking care of patients. Maybe you need some backup in area that have very high exposure. So people that are not at work, but are ready to come in case the staff becomes exposed. Um, among medical personnel, including a reading room, if there is such a reading room in your, in your practices, distance is important between the personnel itself. The, if you share workstations to read the ultrasound, it's important to clean them before or after use and certainly between shifts. And if possible, read ultrasound at a distance. This is, of course, not always possible. Not everybody has such an arrangement, but if possible, that is certainly a good thing to do. Now, before you start the scan, before you start your day, it's important to triage patients. What does that mean? The first thing is before arrival, if possible, you should determine which scan is an elective scan, which one is urgent, which one is emergent. 
The elective ones can be delayed for a week, two weeks, three weeks, maybe more. When the patients arrive, several things need to be done. Risk of infection, and you can do that, in fact, if uh, your offices are calling patients in advance, this can certainly be done even before the patients arrive. What's the risk of infection? Does the patient have symptoms? Did they travel somewhere? Did, were they in contact with someone who is possibly infected? And certainly temperature check upon arrival. Now, it's important to respect schedule appointment times because you don't want to have lots of patients waiting in your waiting room. Um, the appointment needs to be spread so that, again, there's no crowding and that allows cleaning between patients. So if you used to have patients every 30 minutes in the past, it's probably better to have them now every 40 or 45 minutes so that you allow some time to uh, clean between patients. As you can see, the uh, waiting rooms uh, are arranged so that there's a, a one chair um, available, uh, one chair block between two chairs um, so that there's distance even if there are many patients in the waiting room. And this way you minimize the number of patients. Space the seats and supply masks to patients and someone with the patients upon arrival if available. If possible, you des designate a specific ultrasound room and probes for use for patients who are suspected or, or known to have COVID-19. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to reduce the number of probes connected to the ultrasound machine to a minimum. For instance, in OBGYN, one abdominal probe, one vaginal probe. All the other probes are removed, they are stored in a closed cabinet so that you don't have to disinfect all your probes in case a patient coughs or sneezes within the designated distance close to the ultrasound machine. Now, a big question is the question of visitors. We are used, a lot of us are used to teach residents, nurses, sonographers, um, and they're all in the room. The, the rule is simple. No visitors should be allowed in the exam room with a patient, including medical trainees and students. Now, in terms of OBGYN, the question is often asked, well, how about the partner? How about the husband or the partner of the patient who is having an OB ultrasound? Obviously, this is not an issue when you do an ovarian ultrasound, but if you do a pregnancy, you know that the couples are always very happy to look at the exam. And that's really up to your own practice. In some places, like mine, the, the, the partner is not allowed in the room except for the five last minutes where we do a quick survey and show the partner the baby. So this is really something that, that you have to decide in your own places. In general, no visitors should be allowed. Uh, so the, I, I actually copied uh, from the IUM website uh, some, some uh, uh, notes that practices have written. So you can see that um, these are, are saying that they sorry, that they, they take the temperature of both parties, they check for travel, they don't allow children, uh, they shorten the scan, but they increase the consult time uh, so that they can, they can speak more to the patient and um, uh, the patients are very appreciative. Um, another practice said we only prohibited because it was his swab recommendation. So again, this is something that, that you have to, uh, to decide with, with yourself. A safe way is to assume that every patient has COVID-19 and therefore clean and disinfect the equipment and the room at the end of every clinic. Now, as you all know, washing your hands is one of the most important aspects of that entire uh, issue. So before and after patients encounter, if you contact potentially infectious material before and after removing um, personal protective equipment, and you should wash your hands with an alcohol-based hand rub 
16 or 95 alcohol, or simply by washing your hands with warm water and soap for 20 seconds. Use latex-free disposable gloves during the, the ultrasound exam and change them after every patient. Now the WHO speaks about five moments of hand hygiene. One, before patient contact. Two, before an aseptic task. Three, after body fluid exposure risk. Four, after patient contact. Five, after contact with patient surroundings. So these five are times where you need to wash your hands before and after. And there are some explanation. Uh, th this is in the WHO website, how to perform hand hygiene, put on the gown, put on the mask, put on eye protection, put on gloves. So uh, there are various places where you can see these uh, various indications of how to perform a clean quote unquote exam. Now, if you are called to scan a patient in isolation, all the protective equipment needs to be put on prior to entering the room. This is from the Wuhan textbook or Wuhan uh, handbook, and they will tell you how to uh, first put on work, work, um, work clothes, then wash your hand, then a cap, then the mask, then gloves, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, protective clothing, and then a disposable a pair of gloves. So they use two pairs of gloves and then they explain how to remove those safely. You remove first the first one, then you remove everything, and at the end you remove the inner and then uh, wash your hands again. Uh, it, it is important to uh, the, the order and, and um, uh, when you remove the gloves, you remove the gown, then you wash your hands and then remove the eye protection or the mask. This is an important step because when you remove the gown, you may touch it, it may have been uh, soiled. Therefore, they recommend washing your hands before you remove your mask or your eye protection and then washing your hands again. Yes, this is a little complicated, but this is really the way uh, to protect yourself. Now, if you remember early in the process, a lot of healthcare givers, healthcare providers were infected because we were not following this exact sequence of doning and doffing the personal protective equipment. This was published in May 2020, again uh, from India, very detailed on how to do all this. And this is really the best way to uh, protect yourself uh, against infection. We know today that this is the best way. Um, anything that is reusable should be properly clean and decontaminated. Um, again, obviously, surgical face mask when in close contact, disposable eye protection. Remember that eyeglasses are not protection. So if you think you're going to be in contact with someone who is suspected, in addition to the surgical face mask, you need eye protection. Um, put on glo gloves, dispose of them when leaving the room, perform hand hygiene. If it is a reusable gown, you can clean it. Um, and uh, uh, those that are disposable must be discarded. Now, because these are expensive, because they may be in small, short numbers, uh, obviously the gowns have to be prioritized for aerosol generating procedures and high contact patient care activities. Patient known or suspected to have COVID-19, you need respiratory protection, which is the N95, rather than a surgical mask, particularly if you're exposed to aerosol generating procedures, such as an intubation, or you're doing an ultrasound, a long ultrasound in a patient who is intubated in the intensive care unit. You need eye protection, as I just said, gloves and gowns. Now, this is the New England Journal of Medicine three days ago, four days ago. Um, they, and this is from, from China. Uh, they, they said that um, there is a lot of COVID-19 on the floor 
and in trash cans in hospital wards, and also in protective apparel uh, removal rooms. So the staff should wear shoe covers in wards, covered waste receptacle, and disinfect PP before taking it off. Uh, another uh, response uh, also from China, hands may have been contaminated and therefore they talk about two pairs of gloves, one before donning on the gown and then a second pair after the gown is on. And after hand disinfection, you can remove the face shield, then the first pair of, of gloves. So um, uh, this is the, the, the safest way to do things. Uh, and um, from Boston Medical Center, uh, the CDC um, says that surgical masks instead of respirators, uh, if you wear a glove, gown, and a protection. So um, uh, if you're protected, you don't really need an N95, although again, the N95 is necessary during aerosol generating procedures. Let's move now to um, cleaning and disinfection. So um, it's, it's important to uh, um, know the virus and understand its property so that we can denature uh, that virus. So this is the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. It has a, an envelope with several protein and it has a lipid bilayer envelope. Why is this important? This is important because of susceptibility of organism. So if we look on top, bacterial spores are the most resistant to disinfectants. At the bottom of the scale are the lipid enveloped viruses, including influenza and including the SARS-CoV-2. Now, if we look on the right side of that, um, uh, cartoon, and that is how you need to get rid of those. The bacterial spores, if you use sterilization, you're going to get rid of everything. HLD or high level disinfection, mid level disinfection, and low intermediate and low level disinfection. You can see that with low level disinfection, you get rid of the virus. So even though this is a terrible virus, it is very susceptible to relatively mild cleaning. Very important to remember. These are the good news. So most disinfectant will disrupt the bilayer lipid of that virus. So it's very important to clean first before disinfecting. In other words, if your probe your transducer has gel on it, for instance, you first must need to get rid of it because even water on the probe uh, or, or gel will prevent the disinfecting agent from reaching the entire transducer. Um, so uh, we'll come to transducer in a minute. So you, can, you should clean surfaces using soap and water, routine cleaning of surfaces that are frequently touched, High touch surfaces include tables, doorknobs, light switches, countertops, handles, desks, phones, keyboard, toilet, faucet, sinks, etc. All these should be cleaned ideally between each patient, but certainly uh, at the end of the day. Now, there's a lot of disinfectant that are a household that were perfectly fine uh, for, for the virus. You need to follow the instruction. Uh, most product will, will ask to keep the surface wet for a minute or two. Uh, you should wear gloves, have good ventilation. Diluted household bleach solution may be used if appropriate. Follow the manufacturer, check the label, um, assure it's not past the expiration date. And these are certainly effective against the coronavirus when properly diluted. Again, leave them on the surface for, for at least one minute. You can also use alcohol solution with at least 70% alcohol. Um, in May, a uh, month ago, the WHO uh, put out 
a, a uh, document on cleaning and disinfection of surfaces in the context of COVID-19. And again, the same that I just said, alcohol, 70 to 90%, chlorine or bleach-based products uh, are possible, or hydrogen peroxide, more than 0.5%. So again, these are relatively simple uh, products, alcohol, H2O, um, H2O2, chlorine-based product, and they certainly are more than sufficient to clean surfaces. What about ultrasound transducers? Well, ultrasound transducers are defined as reusable medical devices. Um, they are very sensitive instrument, so it's essential to follow manufacturer's uh, uh, instructions to use only approved agents and follow the instructions for use, IFU. So even though each manufacturer has uh, separate instructions, uh, some of them are very general, and this is what I will share with you. You can go to the websites of your own uh, ultrasound machines, and I went to most of the websites of most ultrasound machines, and if you, if you dig a little bit, you'll be able to find a list of agents that this specific manufacturers allow you to use. However, those that I'm going to talk about are safe probably uh, for most um, uh, transducers. Now, the, the issue is, of course, that if you don't reprocess properly between patients, there's a certain risk of transmission of the virus. Um, we had published uh, three years ago guidelines for cleaning transvaginal ultrasound transducer between patients. Uh, this is the uh, safety committee of the World Federation. And this was a very uh, quoted article because we had given a very clear um, instructions on how to clean. Um, we just published this one, uh, which includes transducer, but not only um, uh, tra a vaginal transducer, but transducer in general, which is again uh, available online. Now, the first and most important step when you when you are going to clean a transducer is to remove everything that can act as a barrier, uh, and therefore would diminish the efficacy of the uh, disinfecting agent. So you need to remove the gel, wash with a soft detergent and water. Uh, you can use a soft brush from Grooves and then dry the transducer because residual water can dilute the disinfectant and therefore be less effective. After cleaning the ultrasound, transducer is ready for disinfection. Now, there is a very interesting classification system that is very well known and works very well, and it's the Spalding classification system. It classifies medical instruments into non-critical or low risk, semi-critical, which offer a medium, medium risk of infection, and critical, where there's a high risk of infection. When there's low risk, we can use low level disinfection, which will destruct most bacteria, some viruses, in, viruses including the COVID-19 virus and some fungi. It will not necessarily inactivate uh, mycobacterium TB or bacterial spores as you saw um, in, the, in the cartoon earlier, but these are extremely rare, so not <coughs> in a routine clinic. Mid-level disinfection will inactivate uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, bacteria, most viruses, most fungi, and some bacterial spores. And high-level disinfection, which is uh, also sterilization, will destruct uh, everything, maybe some, except some bacterial spores. Now, how about non-critical transducers? These are transducers that come into contact with intact skin 
for instance, transabdominal ultrasound, MSK, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound, thyroid, uh, kidneys, gallbladder. You clean them first, then you use a low level disinfectant. Because as we said again, low level disinfection will denature most bacteria and the COVID-19 as well as influenza and uh, the HIV vir virus. Uh, this is an example from one website from, from one uh, manufacturers where uh, the following uh, disinfectant can be used and they, they show examples from Europe, the US, Korea uh, of various ingredients that can be used uh, to, to clean uh, transducers. So again, uh, this is one example. Uh, I believe this is Samsung, but you can find uh, in every website um, of, the of the manufacturers, similar tables. How about semi-critical transducers? So these are transducers that come into contact with non-intact skin, with blood, bloody fluid, mucous membranes, and open wounds, as well as vaginal and rectal probes. You must use a probe cover, clean first, of course, then use high level disinfectant. This is normal practice. We have recommended this before, so there's no change due to COVID-19. We said before, use a single transducer cover, not necessarily a um, sterile one, but a single use transducer cover and high level disinfectant, no change. How about critical transducers? These are transducers used for invasive procedures, such as needle guidance during biopsies, aspirations, drainage, and there's possible risk of blood or body fluid exposure. You clean first, then you use sterilization if compatible or high level disinfectant. Single use sterile transducer covers are mandatory for those. And again, this is normal practice, no change due to COVID-19. I want to stress this, for semi-critical or critical, we haven't recommended any change. The only change was for the first one. Now, here is the document that AIUM produced a few years ago, and a few weeks ago, they updated it and included changes due to the COVID-19 outbreak and um, they say level of disinfection for external and interventional procedure, low level disinfection is effective. Uh, if there is no low level disinfection, soap and water can be used per CDC guideline. Um, no transducer, if there are no transducer covers, medical gloves or other physical barrier can be used. So, um, for low level uh, uh, transducer, uh, some will say, well, because of the COVID-19, let's use a probe cover, which is not what has been recommended, but some, some will do it and that's fine. And the IOM stresses that dissemination of clinic, cleaning guidelines are essential so that uh, everybody can do their job. Um, cleaning should involve everything uh, and the cover sheet may be used as a physical barrier between the keyboard and the operator. Now, I have seen places where a um, curtain made of uh, transparent plastic was used with, with a um, uh, um, place where the, the, pay, the uh, examiner can, can put their hand uh, it's like uh, um, uh, for, for, and you can actually perform an ultrasound in a sterile fashion without being in close contact to the patient. I've also seen this in, in uh, places where uh, patients uh, are allowed to receive guests when there is a separation, a plastic separation between them. I believe that in Brazil, someone has created something, something like this. Um, so, um, again, I want to stress that 
procedures where they can be aeros aerosol. Uh, one needs to be especially uh, cautious, such as places with medical ventilation. Even though medical me mechanical ventilation is a closed circuit, uh, you still need to, to be cautious. Um, and that's where an ultrasound, co a transducer cover should be used and, and then perform low level disinfection for the whole process because the pathogen in aerosol uh, procedures uh, can become airborne. Always follow the manufacturer guidance and of course your institution guidelines. So this is something that is on the IOM website, um, transducer preparation and cleaning. And uh, again, these are the three types of transducer, the external transducer, the interventional percutaneous procedures and the internal transducers. So for the external transducer, um, no cover is needed uh, if it is used on non-intact skin, certainly a single-use cover. St gel does not need to be sterile and I voluntarily choose that side of the cartoon of, of the drawing because this is probably the most, the one that we was most commonly used, uh, transabdominal, thyroid, kidneys, etc. And, and in fact, uh, pregnancy uh, when we use the abdominal route and then the cleaning is low level disinfection. When we do interventional percutaneous procedures, uh, single use cover, um, sterility if the procedure has to be sterile, the gel should be sterile, and we use low level disinfection, but if contaminated, high level disinfection. And the last one is internal transducer procedures, uh, vaginal rectal, uh, single use cover. If on the other hand, we do an intraoperative, that's the other side, again, the sterile, sterile cover will be needed if uh, the procedure is sterile. Uh, better to use sterile or bacteriostatic gel and then high level disinfection. And again, I want to stress that this is the only thing that is different from what we regularly recommend. So the middle column and the right column is what we do in general, not when there is COVID-19 in general. The left column is slightly different because in normal conditions, we just recommend uh, cleaning the probe, uh, but now we recommend low level disinfection, which in some places is performed anyway between patients, but when there is no pandemic or infection of that type is not necessarily recommended. So I want you to wear a mask. I want you to wash your hands and your ultrasound transducers and I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy now to take questions. And we do have at least one question. I love that picture. Um, let me know if you're able to find the questions or I'm happy to read yes. them out loud. So the question that I have is, if medical trainees and sonography students are not allowed into the room with a patient, what can be done to ensure their learning and allow them to feel their competencies. So this, um, you, you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so th this is a very important question. And again, uh, you have to, to apply common sense. It is possible that with all the precautions necessary, that is mask and gloves, and washing your hands and you have triaged the patient and you are quite certain that the patient is not COVID-19 positive or suspect, you could have um, a trainee in the room for a short time. Uh, I think that um, it is the, the, the time now to use other means of teaching, uh, whether they are uh, simulation, but as I said, there are some practices 
where partners are allowed in the room during the exam. Again, this has to be local. Um, the recommendation is not to have people in the room, and I understand, but you know, this is a question that is similar to the children that do not go to school. Somehow, or, or residents that, that were, were not, allowed, were not um, able to perform a lot of, uh, of, the, of the, the same procedures as before. So one has to, to adopt, to adapt. And uh, again, uh, common sense has to work. Uh, second question that I can see is, do you recommend single-use gel packets for intact clean skin? Um, the answer is um, ideally yes, <clears throat> but, and, and this is what uh, the, the Wolfram recommendations include, uh, but these are not absolutely necessary because we don't need to use a, a, um, a sterile cover for uh, non um, for, for low level disinfection and for um, uh, sorry ah. this is my uh, okay this is my timer that says that I should stop talking um, um, <laughs> keep talking yeah yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think that that uh, clean gel is 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 okay. Now there there are there are publications where they say that gel in bottles uh, should not be topped up. So you fill up your bottle at the beginning of the day, and at the end of the day, you empty the bottle, clean it, and use a new bottle. Uh, and use the bottle with new amount of gel in the morning. So uh, sterile sterile gel single-use sterile gel is not uh, recommended. It's a lot of money. It's not available everywhere. Um, on clean, intact skin, it is not absolutely necessary. Uh, next question, is there a risk with the fan of the machine aerolyzing the virus? That's a very good question. Um, there is a certain risk. But uh, the fan is, think about the arrangement of, of your ultrasound room. You sit in front of the machine, so does the patient, and the ultrasound machine is a little behind with the fan in the back of the machine. So <clears throat> what would need to happen is the patient coughing or sneezing towards the back of the machine without a mask, having virus float in the air and then being pushed by the machine towards the back of the room. So is there a risk? Yes, there is a little bit of risk, but I think it's probably minimal. Um, next question, what is the role of research in this environment? Should research be limited or at a reduced scan time? Um, so I think that this, the, the answer to this is very similar to the uh, answer I gave regarding uh, students or teaching. Um, research, uh, depending on what you do, if you do clinical research on patients uh, because you're going to, uh, to uh, measure something in their liver or their kidneys, uh, I think that um, scan time should probably be reduced. Now, again, if you have triaged the patient, patient is negative, patient does not have a temperature, patient has a mask, you have a mask, you are protected, the risk is probably not very high. Is it low? No, it's not low, it is, it's not zero. You know very well that even if you have a mask and the patient has a mask and has vir the virus, Protection is not 100%. Uh, so if, if you can perform your research with a gown um, and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, protection and limited time, 
it's probably preferable. Is the risk very high? No, it's not very high, but but it's there, and and uh, you know, it's it's a it's a decision that that you have to take. How does the economics of this play into everything? Well, um, that's a very important question. Unfortunately, uh, to completely protect yourself and your patients is indeed expensive. Masks are expensive. N95 respirators are certainly expensive. Gowns, single-use gowns are expensive. Um, and, and there's no doubt that um, uh, that's a problem in certain areas of the world. Um, how how can, you, can you deal with that? Uh, I think that um, the most important part, if I had to, to choose, would be obviously to wear long sleeves, not to scan in shorts. I don't believe that a lot of you scans in shorts, but uh, long sleeves, um, mask and eye protection and gloves, wash your hands before and after, That's the have the patient have a mask too. And I think that in this way, you are providing quite a good amount of protection to yourself and the patient um, without spending too much money. Now, the truth is that there are a lot of patients that can be totally asymptomatic and still carrier of the virus. We know that. But uh, if they, they have a mask, you have a mask, um, and eye protection, and you wash your hands carefully before and after, that probably offers uh, some protection. Next question, uh, any comments on the use of ultrasound on labor and delivery? Low level disinfection may not be as available as in the perinatal unit. Does it discourage using if low level disinfection is not available? So the answer, the answer is, is no, I do not discourage the use. What I would emphasize is that you can perform low level disinfection with certain wipes. And, and uh, you, you, you don't have to, uh, to use, uh, there are a lot of wipes that are relatively not expensive that are very good to do low level disinfection. Otherwise, water and soap is also good, paying attention, of course, not to, uh, to drown the transducer into the, in the sink, but um, you can certainly use uh, either uh, specific wipes or uh, so, uh, water and soap if you use, of course, uh, abdominal scanning. Transvaginal scanning is another issue, and I would certainly discourage transvaginal scanning on labor and delivery if you're not able to perform uh, more, more uh, in-depth disinfection. Next question from Bernadette. Uh, what are your thoughts in regard to using UV lights in disinfecting systems? System, uh, system surfaces. Okay, so uh, the answer is yes, it works. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, you have to pay attention to your eyes. There are lots of ways to to uh, uh, clean to to clean the room. There's also UV systems to clean uh, the probes that clean a probe in in uh, ninety seconds. Uh, again, these these are uh, expensive, uh, but work very well. So yes, if you have a UV light uh, in, in you, if you can have a UV light in the room, if you take the right precaution, that probably will work well. Ahmed asked, would surgical mask be enough rather than respirators for OBGYN daily practice? The answer is yes. Um, uh, in a regular practice for OBGYN, a surgical mask um, is enough. And Jeanette, what specific LLD solution do you use for your practice? Um, well, in my practice, we use Trophon, uh, which is certainly a, a good uh, solution, but is not available everywhere. Uh, in in uh, Australia, uh, England, Tristel has wipes that are very good. Um, you can find, uh, depending on where you practice, 
uh, uh, very available low-level solutions uh, to use in your in your uh, in your local. Then, previous guidelines indicated cleaning an HDL after interventional procedure in all cases because sheath integrity may become compromised but not be obvious to your user. New guidelines say LLD is okay if sheath is not compromised. Please comment on LLD versus HLD after interventional guidance. So th this has been uh, an, an argument in, in, uh, in many places. The safety uh, is to say, well, use HLD because it is possible that the sheath uh, has become compromised. Uh, some people have tried to show that no, uh, the risk of infection, the risk of the sheath to become compromised is very low. The literature that was published that said, well, uh, there was a very high risk that the, the condom, which is what they used, was disrupted. Um, is, is relatively older literature, uh, which is why uh, LLD is probably enough. Um, now, you know, there are some people who say, well, if it was your, your, your wife, your sister, your daughter, uh, who had a transvaginal scan, or yourself having a transrectal scan, would you want the probe to have LLD or HLD? And the answer is probably, well, yeah, probably HLD. Is it entirely justified by science? There is some literature saying yes, but um, a lot of that literature is, is in fact uh, generated, not generated, by supported by some of the companies. And um, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, difficult to, to, to have um, clear data. The, it, it, the, the way you should be doing that is, of course, a double-blind study where you would do a low level and high level and then make sure that some of the patients are infected, but that would be a very difficult study to perform. Uh, is there any, Matt asks, is there any concern for gel warmers on the system? Uh, the concern uh, no, because this is certainly the, the gel warmer should be cleaned. If it's on this integrated on the ultrasound system, should be cleaned uh, when, you, when you clean the system. So you clean the track ball, you clean the gel warmer. Uh, if you're talking about external gel warmer, the answer is no, there's no risk because uh, you're going to clean them. Uh, the, the question is the gel inside which is why I said that in general, gel, the, the bottle, the small bottles that you use should not be topped, topped up and, and should be uh, discarded at the end of the day um, and then cleaned and you reuse the next day. Anonymous asks, is gown absolutely necessary? No, it is not absolutely necessary because um, if you go to, to, uh, to a restaurant or if you go to, to a store, you wear your, uh, your mask, your gloves, uh, you don't wear a gown. Uh, of course, you keep distance when you go to the grocery store. Here you don't keep distance. Um, but if you are performing a procedure uh, that is not aerosol um, uh, generating, uh, it's probably not um, absolutely necessary. Again, the, each, each uh, place has to, to, uh, to deal with, with its own risk uh, taking. Uh, if there is the possibility, if you are in a very uh, rich place, I'm sorry to have to say that, that you can use a gown, um, Will that protect you more than if you don't? Yes. Is the risk very high to get infected if you don't wear a gown? The answer is no. If you're not present in non-aerosol generating procedures, if you have a mask, eye protection, gloves, long sleeves, the risk of you getting infected is probably minimal. Now, 
you have to follow the rules, you know, clean your hands before, clean your hands after you remove the mask, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that I've said. Um, if you know the patient is a COVID-19, for instance, they ask you to perform a long ultrasound on a patient who's COVID-19 in the ICU, yeah, of course, definitely I would wear a gown. Otherwise, um, with, with enough precautions, it's probably not entirely necessary. Dr. Abramowitz, do you have time for one or two more questions? I have we're time. at the top of the hour. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll do I'll one try. or two more. Okay, so the next one by Gloria is, what is the recommendation for pediatric patients under the age of two unmasked? Uh, that is a question that I don't know the answer to. I'm sorry. Um, it, it's a very good question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an OBGYN, as I told you. I'm very much involved with ultrasound, and I've been involved with the WHO, uh, Wolfram, AIUM, in writing the recommendations for ultrasound. But regarding pediatric patients, I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see, more question. Is there a recommendation you have as an OB-GYN physician to still attain diagnostic image for an OB patient who may be exhaling heavily due to pressure on the lung from a gravid state, but refuses to wear a mask for the same reason? Huh. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, I would say it really depends on what's the indication for the scan. I think that everybody has to take responsibility in these times uh, because uh, nothing here is personal. This is a societal problem. And, and refusing to wear a mask, and I'm not going to go into politics here, even though you're going to be able to understand where I stand. I think that wearing a mask is really not a big, big issue. It's such a simple thing to do. And we know that it does reduce the infection rate. Does not prevent it completely, I'll grant you that, but it does reduce it. So unless the patient has an emergency, I would tell the patient, well, you know, I'm not sure that we can perform an ultrasound on you. Uh, she, if, I would rather say, well, why don't we try to perform an ultrasound in the sitting position rather than in the semi-laying position? Uh, in the sitting position, it may be easier to wear a mask. Uh, you don't want to wear a mask. Why don't you wear a bandana on your face, a face cover that doesn't need to be a mask, but some cover because in case you are um, COVID positive and you exhale heavily, you're going to infect uh, uh, the surroundings. So, I would try to re reason with a patient, try to scan her in a sitting position. Um, I mean, I've scanned patients in standing positions when they were in congestive heart failure. It's not fun, but it, it's possible to do. So that, that's, that's how I would, I would deal with that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on proper storage of transducer between exam? Matt, Matt asks, should I cover them post cleaning? How about transabdominal transducers? Uh, yes, I absolutely would cover them between exams. We actually do that in my practice. Uh, we did that way before um, the COVID-19. Once the probe is clean, we cover it with, with, a, with a wipe, uh, even the transabdominal transducers. Um, storage uh, between exams. Uh, yes, on the machine uh, with, with some sort of cover. If the room is clean, you've cleaned the room, you've cleaned the transducer, uh, there's no reason uh, why you cannot use that probe for the next patient if you've gone through the proper um, um, uh, process. Once you've cleaned it, once you've cleaned the room, uh, theoretically there's no virus in there or very little, so um, you don't need to store it in a closed, enclosed area in a closet. You can leave it on the machine with, with, with a cover. Okay. Uh, we're gonna, Dr. Abramowitz, we're gonna have to um, call a, a stop now. Okay, um, so but, you, yeah. you, you, uh, thank you for your attendance. That's been uh, mm -hmm. great. 
you have my email on that last slide and feel free to email me. Uh, I try to respond to emails immediately or within 24 hours. So if you have, uh, if you have specific questions, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to try and respond. Thank you. And on behalf of the AIUM and Samsung, our thanks to all of you who participated today. Um, we'd like to remind you that a recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. So thank you for joining us. Stay safe and thank you for the work you're doing on the front lines of this pandemic.